Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. and welcome to today's virtual program for the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Melissa Kane, and I am a lawyer, journalist, and author here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I'm very honored to be moderating today's program. And I'm pleased to be joined by Spencer Ackerman. He is a contributing editor at the Daily Beast and the author of the new book, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. Uh, Spencer's book takes a deep dive into the war on terror and its effects on America, both globally and here at home. Now, this book posits that a politically divided country turned the war into a cultural and then a tribal struggle, starting with some right wing fringe politics and ultimately expanding to conquer the Republican Party, often with the timid acquiescence of the Democratic Party. We're going to be discussing a lot in the next hour, and we're definitely going to be talking about Afghanistan, if that's what's on your mind today. But I do want to hear uh, your questions as well. So if you're watching along with us, please put those questions in the chat in the chat text area of YouTube, and we will get to them later in the program. So to begin, thank you, Spencer Ackerman, for joining us. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you so much to the Commonwealth Club for having me. So Spencer, we're going to, I want to jump in to talk about Afghanistan quickly, but before we do that, to give that conversation some context, could you start with a, a bit of an overview about the thesis and the argument that you make in this book? Yes. Yeah, so the argument is that the 9-11 era has a very profound and uh, frightening effect on American democracy uh, from a institutional perspective through the passage of uh, sometimes laws, sometimes broken laws, um, an apparatus is created of mass surveillance uh, on a scale that a generation before would have found unfathomable and certainly illegal. Um, secret prisons, outright torture, uh, the creation of a security context for immigration, the idea essentially that immigration is a national security threat more than it is a process of generating more Americans, um, and a domestic law enforcement apparatus that is willing to uh, spy on entire communities and even place informants generated through coercion typically uh, in places of worship like mosques. And culturally beyond that, um, while all of this institutional hollowing out takes place, a very profound thing happens in the sense that there's a deliberate imprecision placed on who the enemy is. Uh, from the start after 9-11, we're not told we're in a war against Al-Qaeda, which is to say a specific uh, set of actors who did a specific violent thing um, and really only those people. Instead, we get this expansive and curious category known as the war on terror. And what that ultimately leads to is a sense that the enemy isn't just this one you know, culprit for 9-11. It is potentially, depending on various interpretations of this, something like your Muslim neighbors or all of Islam. And over time, the effects of this operate as a gateway, a door that opens towards some of the most atavistic and violent nativist currents in American history that now under the cover of national emergency are empowered and they use the tools of uh, this new institutional architecture of counterterrorism. And viewed in that light, um, I tell a story that 
develops all of this narratively, looking at all aspects of the war on terror, not just Afghanistan, not just Iraq, but also, you know, the things I mentioned, CIA torture, uh, NSA mass surveillance, um, the militarization of the border, um, and the otherization of an ever expanding category of Americans. And the conclusion that the book draws, particularly when accompanied by the acquiescence of American liberalism in most cases in the Democratic Party, uh, we have a circumstance in which a figure like Donald Trump and the movement that he champions uh, becomes something like inevitable. Well, one of the things that I, I think people are examining or even debating right now when it comes to Afghanistan is, is this, as you put it, sort of inartful uh, target, sort of the, uh, uh, you call it, you know, the war without end. It's it's something because there was no way to declare victory. Uh, we're in a position now to be, you know, removing ourselves from Afghanistan and, and asking what have we accomplished? And so can you talk about how these things are related and what is your take on, on what you're seeing right now? Absolutely. The first thing that we should recognize in talking about this is the abject human misery that's on display, not just um, in, you know, the capital city of Kabul, but, you know, throughout Afghanistan and now really acutely um, at Hamid Karzai International Airport, where just yesterday we saw horrific videos of desperate people trying to grab hold to departing C-17s and falling to their deaths. And I'm a native New Yorker, and the only thing I could really think of was watching people jump out of the burning towers. So we have to start our understanding, not just of Afghanistan, but war in general, with a recognition of the ineradicable human suffering that sometimes we can view too much as an abstraction. It's not an abstraction. These are people with lives and souls. And it is because of those people's agency, the lives and souls that they possess, the value inherently of their lives, that we have to recognize that the United States' 20-year war in Afghanistan left nothing endurable except human suffering. That what we're seeing unfold in Afghanistan is not the absence of a war, but the results of a war. What do I mean by that? In December of 2001, the Taliban having been driven out of Kabul, the Islamic Emirate having fallen, bivouac to Kandahar to make a kind of last stand in the city that they emerge from in southern Afghanistan. And they come really strongly under assault in a way that prompts many senior members of the Taliban in Kandahar to say that this is hopeless and we need to surrender. And hopefully what we can do is negotiate some kind of way that if we demobilize and commit ourselves to joining a political process for what comes after um, the Islamic Emirate will retain some kind of influence, will retain some kind of power. Principally what the Taliban wanted was to ensure that its then leader, uh, Mullah Mohammed Omar, could stay under some kind of house arrest. Um, and Hamid Karzai, having lived through um, what at that point had been 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan, he of course fled the country um, for a lot of that, immediately took the deal recognizing that in order to secure an actual post-Taliban Afghanistan, there had to be a place for the Taliban, otherwise a greater disaster could result. Donald Rumsfeld and the Bush administration publicly refused that deal. Rumsfeld stood at the Pentagon podium in early December of 2001 and said that the US would not accept a negotiated surrender. What it sought uh, was an unconditional surrender. He was speaking, trying to um, will the country into a kind of World War II-esque um, sense of uh, victory. Um, and a negotiated settlement uh, just wouldn't do. Now, why wouldn't it do? It becomes necessary to look back at that point about the deliberate imprecision of the enemy. That allowed the Bush administration to effortlessly view the Taliban as inextricable from Al Qaeda, that the Taliban weren't something that had to be dealt with 
on its own terms, because Afghanistan would have to be dealt with on its own terms, and not something that would have to be dealt with as a fact, but rather something that ought to be dealt with as a wish, which is to say, wishing the Taliban out of relevance, in addition to hoisting them out of power. Everything that happened in the 20 years since made the Taliban stronger. When ultimately in 2019, Donald Trump, in my view correctly, sues for peace in Afghanistan and seeks to negotiate uh, some kind of settlement with the Taliban, what are ultimately the terms that are reached? A power sharing agreement in Afghanistan that would allow some measure of Taliban control and relevance in addition, in exchange for withdrawing um, from, from the country. Those are the same terms the Taliban offer. Those are the same terms, whether you want to believe, I'll put it this way, none of us will know if the Taliban would have held to that deal. But what we know for an absolute certainty was that we had intensely greater leverage at that time in December 2001 than we would ever have again, and certainly more leverage than we had ultimately in 2020 when the deal is struck. Well, do you think that politically, though, it was viable for them to, like just a couple of months after 9-11 happened, for for there to be a negotiated peace with the people who um, maybe had been misled or um, we'd been misled to believe, but people who had been lumped together with the people who perpetrated 9-11. I mean, would that would have would that have flown, or is your is your argument that that, that the leadership should have uh, led more in that moment? It, that's exactly right. The latter that that if you were going to actually exercise not just leadership but judgment and strategy, then the course of action to pursue is not something we'll all you know we'll we'll have to guess at. We see it in front of our faces. It is desperate people falling from C-17s from a fleeing a war that America waged and lost. That is the alternative. The path not taken would have been one that distinguished between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. I'll take, you know, I totally take your point. Um, Once the Bush administration committed itself to this expansive definition, there's just no way to get um, to that distinction between Al Qaeda and the Taliban, let alone what Bush, you know, wraps up in the rest of it. Ultimately, Saddam Hussein and Iraq, which truly have nothing to do with 9/11 or, or Al Qaeda. It's the fact that they made that choice that consigned us, and in particular, consigned the Afghan people to all of this continued extended misery. Ultimately, what we are seeing for nothing. Now, one of the things that we're seeing from the Biden administration and also even from um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is this series of talking points that indicate the problem is that the Afghan people wouldn't fight for themselves, they wouldn't defend themselves, and we weren't going to keep uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but sort of holding their hand and that, you know, if they weren't willing to fight, then why should we be? And these are Democrats. I mean, what do you make of that? line of reasoning that that we're hearing? That it is uh, the liberal variant of American exceptionalism, um, Mm -hmm. something that has manifested not just throughout American history, but in particular in a supercharged way uh, during um, the the war on terror writ large. Uh, You'll remember that during the darkest days of the occupation of Iraq, uh, the line that typically went out was that the war was going so well, if not for the Iraqis who had rejected this foreigner's gift of freedom. Um, This was expressed in both respectable liberal terms. Joe Biden himself put forward a plan to have a soft partition of Iraq, a fundamentally imperial circumstance. Um, And less respectably um, from people like Tucker Carlson who said the problem was that Iraqis were subhumans. Ultimately, um, we see that recapitulated with, as you mentioned, Nancy Pelosi and President Biden talking about how Iraqis just didn't want it um, as hard as they as hard as the Americans did. Well, over the last six or seven years, something like 66,000 Iraqi soldiers and police have been killed in fighting with the Taliban that the United States has not done directly and has only done well, not only, but primarily 
through airstrikes. So I think that's a pretty offensive thing to say. On the other hand, what they're also referencing is that the Afghan security forces very often were not willing to fight the Taliban. I've reported from Afghanistan, certainly not as long as you know many others um, in, in our profession have, but I did get a chance to, to see several things. And among those things was that very often throughout the war, one of the reasons that there were pockets of what you might call stability was because the Taliban and the Afghan national security forces reached a kind of modus vivendi, so they wouldn't be shooting at each other. The Americans always found this kind of risable and unfair to their plans. But the fact of the matter is the Taliban were in many cases getting paid better uh, than the Afghan security forces were. And in most cases would be able to find out not just where those Afghan soldiers and police lived, but where their families lived. And in a circumstance like this, for a government that corrupt, and we shouldn't think of it as a corrupt government that we were saddled with. This was a corrupt government we created. This was a corrupt government whose corruption, because of all of the billions and billions of dollars thrown into the Afghan economy, basically from the development industrial complex, without much consideration about whether A, this would actually benefit Afghans, or B, it would be able to be absorbed by the state of the Afghan economy, a tremendous distorting effect took place that even H.R. McMaster, uh, Donald Trump's uh, second national security advisor, when he was a general on the Afghanistan um, general staff in charge of anti-corruption efforts, recognized that we were a driver of corruption. Blaming this on the Afghans is a very convenient way to flatter American exceptionalism, to say that we're getting out of Afghanistan, but we weren't at fault fundamentally uh, in Afghanistan. The things that the Biden administration isn't doing are very conspicuous. They are engaged in a noble effort, a matter I would argue of national honor, uh, to get those Afghans that served the US war, as well as um, foreign nationals, um, and uh, Afghans who ser served like Western companies in various interests out, but they're stopping there. They're not taking out um, regular Afghans who had often no choice but to endure this war. There is going to be, as there has been throughout the war, a massive refugee flow that people like Biden and now we saw yesterday Emmanuel Macron of France are trying to hive the West off from. This is the liberal version of Donald Trump's border wall. What we could and should be doing is throwing open temporary protected status so that any Afghan who wants to escape what the resurgent Taliban have in store for them can live in peace, safety, and dignity in the United States if they so choose. And it's very striking, but also very characteristic of the United States, and in particular of the war on terror, that we're choosing not to do this, while also bemoaning the fate of these Afghans as a way of castigating a war for ending, rather than recognizing that the war is what led directly to this, and that more war accumulating over years made all of these circumstances worse, so that a furtherance of the war to year 21, 22, 23, would just have more people jumping for those C-17s. So was the should the U.S. have just gone in and maybe done a targeted strike on Al Qaeda? I mean, what what let's go back in the time machine and you are uh, a top aide to Donald Rumsfeld. I know. But just imagine uh, what what do you tell him we should do instead of what we did? Don't declare a war on terror. Don't declare that there is remotely, even really the architecture of a war necessary to do things that the United States has proven capabilities extant on 9-11 to do, which is to target precisely the people uh, who committed the 9-11 attacks and get them and put them on trial. Do not allow millenarian religious fanatics, people who distort their religion in order to make sure that they have a justified pretext for violence uh, in gussied up religious rhetoric that they're warriors, which is the image they seek to project. Instead, 
treat Osama bin Laden like what he is, a billionaire who plays with other people's lives callously and casually like billionaires do all over the world. Wow. What do you make of the um, the finger pointing happening now? Biden says he inherited uh, Trump's agreement and Republicans say, Biden, you, you should have organized this uh, this exit better. And maybe this is um, maybe this is too petty. Maybe we're we're small balling and we should be talking about the bigger picture here. And, and that's an OK answer, too. But what, what do you make of this of the bickering happening right now? The bickering is basically a way of, of meeting out blame to a specific administration that deserves blame. Um, The chaos of this withdrawal uh, really is something that the Biden administration will have to answer for because of all of the lives that are at stake. But the story of the Afghanistan war is a story like the war on terror itself of mass elite complicity. The people who are castigating Biden for pulling out in many cases, are the architects and the justifiers of Donald Trump's deal with the Taliban, which I argue today was the only thing to do in order to get out of Afghanistan. Um, You could have withdrawn unilaterally, but that would have been even worse. Coming up with a modus vivendi of the Taliban was the only way that uh, you could actually secure even what is in tatters um, of, of some semblance of order that you have now. The Taliban is not attacking the airport as of right now. Who knows what ends up changing? But the Taliban is seeming to allow for an evacuation out of foreign nationals, quite possibly to wait until Western eyes are simply gone and then they take their real reprisal measures. Um, but for the time being, they seem like they've seen through negotiations as pretty responsive to the fact of their um, international circumstance. Um, Many people I've talked to who've negotiated with the Taliban talk about how sensitive the Taliban is, um, how they considered uh, their geopolitical isolation ahead of 9-11 to be the driving force of uh, their um, ouster from power. And it's really up to them to decide what their geopolitical future is and uh, statements from out of Uh, a variety of U.S. allied countries last night, which also didn't mention taking in refugees, um, seem to signal that what the Taliban does during the evacuation will determine uh, the world's attitude uh, toward it. There is so much blame to go around politically, economically, journalistically, culturally um, for the war in Afghanistan and the circumstances that permitted it to last this long and become as disastrous as it was. Um, This is how Washington decides that if there is mass elite complicity, then either A, it's important to find one person to blame immediately, or B, to decide that, and I think this is going to be what ultimately happens, that if everyone is kind of equally wrong, no one's really at fault, no harm, no foul, let's go back to our regularly scheduled programming, no one has to lose their jobs, no one has to lose their livelihoods, no one has to lose their authority, no one has to lose their career. And the only thing that gets lost are people's lives, people's freedoms, and people's wealth. Well, you know, there is a concern about the after effects of this whole thing as well. I mean, you've got, let's, once the dust settles, if, if it settles anytime soon, there, there was always a concern about having a, a, a nuclear Pakistan right next door. And um, to your point about, you know, a refugee crisis, I mean, it, it's not, it, it can't be the case that we can just leave and go, uh, you know, okay, and not have other issues to deal with in the region. What do you foresee there? Well, there would need to be an immense diplomatic effort and particularly regional diplomacy uh, to secure some kind of circumstance in which Afghan refugee flows can be managed. Um, The relationship between uh, Taliban controlled Afghanistan and Afghanistan's neighbors and then um, the countries that had um, been occupying and operating um, in Afghanistan. Um, that's going to be um, a very urgent task for policymaking. But you know, really, the central concern here 
is the fate of millions of people who will either be, you know, internally displaced people, uh, refugees um, with no certain destination, um, or uh, in a dire circumstance of repression, um, if not outright reprisal killing. Um, international diplomacy is going to be very necessary to deal with that. And, you know, also, um, it will be an open question if under a Taliban dominated Afghanistan, there will be an appetite amongst Western countries that will now have just seen what they will consider their investment in this country. I think that's a pretty disgusting and dehumanizing way of putting it, but that's how they think and they speak. Um, evaporate. Will they be willing to fund efforts at alleviating the human misery that they directly created, enabled, and maintained? Well, yeah, especially if that funding has to go through or be managed by the Taliban. Uh, and the, just one last question on Afghanistan is, uh, so we're hearing that, that now the administration is saying like, look, we're leaving, but we're going to continue our anti-terror efforts in the way we do in like Syria and Libya and countries like that by doing sort of targeted maybe drone strikes or, um, you know, even maybe ground, um, sort of ground actions, um, is that better <laughs> than than what we have now, or what is your take on this sort of shift from um, a real occupying force to 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 really dealing with Afghanistan the way we have learned to deal with uh, other other countries that that potentially pose issues? No, this is much worse. This is in fact undercutting the end to the war. Um, we've seen throughout the war on terror that when uh, the United States puts caveats in circumstances where it you know, withdraws troops from a theater of conflict, Iraq, um, you know, most importantly, where you know, since 1991, there have been four declared ends to combat operations. Um, there is going to be through the, you know, de- there is going to be through the Biden administration declaring that it reserves the right to bomb Afghanistan as it sees fit, always going to be not just um, options, but escalatory pressures to re-Americanize the war when people will ask what, in fact, the bombing has accomplished. And those are very real risks. It is a very tragic mistake that Biden is choosing to embrace continued uh, war, you know, this time from 30,000 feet, um, as an alternative Uh, to the Afghanistan war, rather than recognizing that it's a continuation of it. And he's doing that because of the political pressures that he's facing right now. And that helps show in microcosm the degree to which there is this broad elite complicity that has now as an inertial um, impulse to maintain these wars rather than cease fighting them, even as we see that fighting them makes them worse. Well, we actually, I apologize. I do have another question for you about Afghanistan, one from a viewer here. So I'm just going to read it for you. Uh, And it's a great question. How do you see the future interactions of China with a Taliban-led Afghanistan playing into the increasing Chinese influence in the Middle East, especially with regard to the sort of great power competition? I mean, there's a Chinese issue here that um, is also looming. Yeah. Um, the same elites that you know gave you the war on terror and that gave you Cold War anti-communism now um, seem really keen on covering up, you know, a kind of recognition that you know the the 9/11 era has really been this horrific by kind of being like, well, America's back. We can do things like compete with the Chinese and maintain uh, our preeminence um, geopolitically and geoeconomically. The Tal- uh, that you know, China certainly wishes that competition to be taking place as a rising power. Um, and this is the way rising powers, you know, very typically act. The Chinese are carrying out a campaign of mass repression um, and, you know, seemingly um, ethnic cleansing against their uh, Muslim populations in Xinjiang province. Um, and it would be entirely unsurprising if the Taliban kind of ignore that and decide like, Muslim countries in the region are right now deciding that, like, perhaps we can look past this, given all of the incentives that the Chinese are putting out there to essentially give 
what looks like in the grand historical scheme of things, the kind of imperial bargain that rising powers very frequently offer to imperial playgrounds of um, either declining or exhausted or otherwise status quo powers. This is exactly what uh, the US did uh, to countries that were under British and French um, imperial suzerainty early in its own um, mid-century, 20th century rise by saying like, look, we have purely commercial interests with you. We have some you know, other interests, but what we're really about is getting along with you, making sure that we grow rich together and we're not going to do things like, you know, um, the British do, like organizing your societies and, and your way of life. Um, we're going to do something that they will bill as less extractive. Now, imperial powers are always extractive and the Chinese will prove to be no different. But in a circumstance like uh, a post-American Taliban run Afghanistan, it will be increasingly um, compelling uh, to a Taliban, particularly if that Taliban is isolated internationally, to turn to China as either a partner or a protector. China may you know, find, as imperial powers have found throughout history in Afghanistan, going back to literally Alexander the Great, that it may regret this decision. Uh, well, I want to get to, um, and we may get some other questions about Afghanistan as well, but I do want to um, dig back into the book. And uh, this is your uh, first book, I think. Uh, yes. Tell me about uh, tell me about the process of, of deciding to write it and why you felt this was the story that you wanted to write. So thinking back to the early days of the Trump administration, there was kind of an explosion um, in journalistic and political circles, um, in explanations for how the Trump phenomenon happened. And some of these were very good and historically informed. Um, my friend Adam Serwer of The Atlantic, um, probably best of anyone, uh, summed up the ways in which very old forms of white nationalism that emerge um, from chattel slavery and then through the Jim Crow apartheid system, but also more broadly um, inside the firmament of both the American um, mind and as well American institutions uh, speak rather directly to the forces that Trump leads, husbands, unleashes, and so forth. Um, other explanations, um, less historically informed, you know, not really so, so compelling, but what all of these explanations on offer um, and there had been so many of them neglected, was that the United States had been at war for so long that brutality was simply background noise. And it was always, from the start, a racially othered brutality, a licensed violence, pardon me, um, that operated both at home and overseas, slipping deliberately the boundaries of legal and institutional um, restraint that operate, you know, when they operate as intended to safeguard American democracy and American freedom. And those bonds had been slipped both institutionally and certainly culturally um, in a way that the war on terror really facilitated. And I just found that that explanation was a crucial part of the story of how we got here. Um, and also, like offered a mechanism for kind of explaining the political alignments that we found in the Trump era, like how it was that, you know, Trump was, while, you know, this wasn't in fact true in practice, but certainly in rhetoric, um, a Republican president who had been running against the war on terror that had been at its inception a Republican, not just creation, but deliberate path to power. Um, how it was that the Democratic Party was aligning with the organs and the practitioners um, of the national security state that had also built, maintained, and become uh, quite a significant constituency for the war on terror, and how both those democratic elites and those uh, retired national security barons joined in horror um, at Trump's attempts at deviation from the war on terror without ever arguing 
for why, in fact, deviation was wrong and continuing wars that they no longer believed in was right. And all of that together just led me to think, well, if no one else is writing this, maybe I have a book here. Uh, and you certainly do. I mean, it's a it's a very it's a large book, y'all. It's <laughs> it is very well researched, and about I think like half of this is footnotes. You do a great job of pointing people to your sources, which I certainly appreciate. And one of the things that you write about is that you one thing you couldn't fit in here that could maybe be its own book is the role of uh, the media in this whole affair. And actually that brings me to an audience question that we have here um, that someone writes, um, what do you think of the role the talking heads in the news have played over the last 20 years? Nicole Wallace said something like 90% of the news people will disagree with Biden's decision, but 90% of Americans would actually agree with him. You agree with her view that there may be a disconnect between talking heads and the regular American people and what impact does does one have on the other? It's you know funny you mentioned Nicole Wallace. Nicole Wallace was George W. Bush's communications director, and now she is one of the premier um, talking heads on the liberal cable news network. Um, we are talking about exceptionally deep media complicity, like all aspects of elite complicity that we see in the war on terror. The so-called liberal media, particularly the explicitly liberal media was very often bloodthirsty, um, very rarely. And I saw this directly in newsrooms that I worked in and newsrooms that colleagues worked in. Um, very often, the purpose of the media was not to inform people, but to filter the reality that they saw away from the hard, critical questions about what the war on terror was. Very often, they preferred euphemism. Very often, they thought in euphemism. Very often, they reflected the fact that ever more so, uh, the media, um, you know, having, you know, you and I have just lived through, you know, 20 years of economic devastation in journalism and the according consolidation of what remains of the media to increasingly fewer hands of ever wealthier people. And Frankly, you know, very often, you know, newsroom people, and I've been one of them, um, really hate this kind of explanation because it seems too broad brush. But, you know, the people who we have our checks signed by are going to have their sensibilities prevail. And their sensibilities overwhelmingly were for the war on terror. They were for this patriotic veil of unreality that was easier to face then was a historically informed and material analysis driven understanding of what the 9-11 attacks were, what the response that the United States pursued was and would be, and ultimately um, how deeply the American people found it respectable to question the war on terror was filtered through very severe limits by the media infrastructure that we have. Don't get me wrong, there has been tremendous, courageous, heroic reporting, including from American sources. Um, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, foreign outlets have done uh, a tremendous job, but really American journalists um, throughout the war on terror have real success stories to show. It's unfortunate that so much of that work are the exceptional stories rather than the basic frames that we tend to take to stories day to day as rapid events unfold and you know things like the Afghanistan deterioration happen, we find ourselves very often with kind of the memory of, of chickens, where if something didn't happen you know, several days, weeks, months ago, we've entirely forgotten how we got here. And we speak about them in these ahistorical ways that only serve to distort the actual picture of these wars. Going to Iraq and Afghanistan was simply nothing like it was portrayed in the news, even when it was portrayed you know, as being like violent disasters. Very often these stories in particular um, excluded the voices of people who were the most affected by them. They wouldn't listen 
to people like um, these are some in, these are some people you'll meet in Reign of Terror, um, Fahim Qureshi, uh, who was a 13 year old boy living in tribal Pakistan on the day that Barack Obama launched the first of many drone strikes into Pakistan. Fahim Qureshi spent 40 days in a coma. He woke up in a hospital with burns all over much of his body. He had lost an eye and he had also lost uh, a lot of the male breadwinners in his family. And he quickly learned once he got out of the hospital that he would have to put his body to work doing whatever work it could, in, it could perform in order to feed his family. And those stories are the important stories of the war on terror, not how Americans felt, but what others experienced because of American choices. And we in the media, I think, have to recognize that we did an appalling job of even being interested in those stories. Well, yeah, and one of the things that um, your book, Reign of Terror, does very nicely is uh, is go into those stories. I mean, we meet a number of people who are directly impacted by some of the things that uh, that persons that American leadership, um, some of the decisions that American leadership and the security state, as you as you put it, um, have done. And it's one of the things that. I also think is great about the book is it as I'm reading through it, I'm rem- I'm remembering things that were such a big deal. I mean, to your point about having memories of chickens, like chickens of, you know, I was like, oh yeah, there was that thing that happened. And then the, the 9-11 mosque and, you know, the World Trade Center mosque and, and all of these things that I had forgotten about because there's a whole new, you know, tidal wave of stuff. And now that the book has come out and is, um, you know, so timely. We actually have an audience question here that says, okay, now what happens in the next five years in the war on terror? Have recent events in this collapse of Afghanistan actually changed your prediction or shifted your view? Uh, I know, again, things are changing all the time, but what do you what do you make of the, or, or did you see it coming? Well, I, I certainly make no claim to prescience, but I think that, um, you know, one of the reasons that and I am certainly no, you know, exception to this. There were many times when I was going back through not just contemporaneous reporting, but my own reporting um, over the last 20 years, where I was just like shocked at what I had forgotten because it seemed now um, so relevant in a context that often I didn't see or that I didn't appreciate, or at the time I didn't have the historical or um, you know material analysis. Uh, to process. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to do um, with Reign of Terror is bring all of this stuff back. Another thing that has kind of, you know, I think been been part of this process, you know, speaking kind of broadly is a kind of cultural, you know, traumatic memory. Um, These these have, you know, been overwhelming disasters um, for so many people's in so many places, but they've also been disasters for Americans, and they've also been traumatic experiences um, for a lot of Americans. Certainly, you know, 9/11, um, when you know I was 21 years old. I'm a native New Yorker, and I watched live on television as something like 2,900 of my neighbors died of violent death, and that's a very serious thing. That that you know, I one thing that I took great pains to get across in the book um, is that like this would not be a book that particularly given the critique it has that treats 9-11 itself as something trivial or something that in the grand scheme of things uh, wasn't um, so terrible or was you know blown out of proportion. No, it was a nightmare that we watched unfold that has shaped my city, my home, people I know forever. And that doesn't excuse the ways in which our suffering in particular as New Yorkers was used by people in power for a violent revenge fantasy that became a compounding disaster. It's more important accordingly um, because of that to conceptualize and contextualize the war on terror in terms that honor that horror and that reveal it rather than obscure it. I don't know where the war on terror goes next. There's talk about 
Mozambique now because there's ISIS there. There is a uh, deep fear that uh, the, you know, still filled uh, Syrian jails, makeshift jails um, in Eastern Syria where the US did or still operates um, with all of these ISIS fighters and their families um, will eventually, you know, soon enough be the incubator of um, the next generation of ISIS, whatever it calls itself, that this cycle, if it's allowed to continue, will produce predictable results. It will keep the U.S. in these forever wars that will justify increasing apparatuses, uh, apparati, pardon me, of repression, uh, tools that can be very easily repurposed at home against internal domestic enemies, particularly as our politics continues to shatter and shatter in scary and violent ways. Um, and the justifications for extracting a massive amount of public wealth that overwhelmingly has been redistributed upward into the hands of the defense industry. Yeah, that's one thing that I just can't wrap my head around. Where did it go? There doesn't seem to be any any there there to show for it. I think that's part of a lot of people's frustration, maybe why they're willing to sort of throw in the towel of, uh, you know, on our, on our occupation. Now, one of the audience members has asked, and, you know, to your point about the uh, surveillance state, this person asked, is there any legislation um, maybe in the works that would reverse the surveillance of U.S. citizens? And um, should we be hopeful that this might change at some point in the near future. Only with public pressure will that happen. There are no current bills in a real comprehensive way uh, to repeal the surveillance apparatus right now. Those bills, what happens instead is that every several years, uh, Congress votes typically uh, to reauthorize and ratify another period of overwhelmingly expansive um, NSA and um, downstream of that FBI surveillance. Um, only when, I, look, I was one of the reporters on the Snowden story. And one of the things that I saw was the way in which the Obama administration, the NSA, and uh, the intelligence um, direct, uh, the director of national intelligence uh, and their allies in Congress was very willing to throw overboard um, the bulk collection of Americans' phone records, uh, because A, that was the aspect of the bulk collection that exclusively concerned Americans' communications, um, rather than Americans' foreign communications and foreigners' communications, and also was increasingly the least relevant aspect of NSA surveillance, because your phone records do not give you nearly the kind of rich data that collecting your signals from your browser history, uh, your texts, you, all of your social media, your Fitbits, um, your perhaps uh, very intimate uh, applications that emit electronic signals, the connections you have um, at scale with lots of people. Increasingly, and this is uh, the, the part that's really quite dangerous, um, that surveillance is entirely symbiotic with 21st century capitalism, what the Harvard Business School professor emerita Shoshana Zuboff has so eloquently and presciently described as surveillance capitalism. The NSA realized that it could just piggyback off the surveillance that all of these companies, particularly social media giants, already do through a program called PRISM. Um, that's Microsoft, that's, um, that's uh, YouTube, that's Google, obviously, you know, YouTube's uh, parent company, Facebook, Apple, on and on. Um, surely there, there are more um, tech giants uh, and more social media giants that are having um, this relationship with the NSA under PRISM, um, in addition to other uh, bulk surveillance tools that the NSA um, possesses. Um, so the urgency of uh, activism, the urgency of organizing, the urgency of articulating an alternative conception, not just um, to a surveillance economy, 
but the economic conditions that allow for such a surveillance economy to have taken such deep root is what's going to be necessary. It's a massive task uh, to repeal this if it's going to be abolished. Well, what do you make of the, uh, as you pointed out, there's the uh, authorizations for use of force that that come up um, routinely. And I believe two of them are now being de- actually debated and may or may not pass, not totally clear. Uh, should they uh, be amended? Should they be re-upped? And, and if they're not, how helpful would that be? So um, right now, the two that are up for the chopping block that surely I think it's fair to say will get the chopping block are uh, the 2002 authorization to invade Iraq against Saddam Hussein um, and also uh, a weird vestige of uh, the original 1991 war against Saddam Hussein um, that, believe it or not, still on the books. Um, so what we can kind of see there is, is, is two things. Um, first, Repealing any war authorizations is the fact that that 1991, you know, AUMF still exists, um, is extremely difficult in Congress. Um, All of the political incentives run toward keeping a war going rather than um, repealing the basis for that war. Um, The fact that we're able to see the possible, I would, I would, I think, likely end of the 2002 AUMF. Um, in particular, is because of really valuable, um, diligent activist work um, by anti-war groups on Capitol Hill, including many people I've, I've spoken with over the years, as well as some uh, really courageous lawmakers and legislative aides um, who feel the need to abolish the war on terror very acutely. On the other hand, we also have to recognize that Congress is much more willing to repeal the 2002 AUMF than it is the 2001 AUMF. Uh, The authorization voted into law days after 9-11 that grants the president extremely expansive authority, particularly after um, an amendment offered in the uh, 2011 um, National Defense Authorization Act uh, that kind of subtly redefined al-Qaeda in an even more vague way that allows for affiliated groups to also be um, under the rubric of the 2001 AUMF. That's a law that absolutely has to be repealed if there's ever going to be any hope of ending the war on terror. And that's going to take even more work than the, than repealing the 2002 one required. Well, I mean, there is, there is a problem and I'm going to, I see an audience question I'm going to ask in a slightly different way, but there, there is this issue though, if you're a person in power and you take your foot off the gas, if there is then another attack, if there's another 9-11, if there's some other, um, some other attack, um, a, it's on your watch and you're, you and your party are going to pay politically for it. And B, we're probably going to be right back um, with this sort of, I think, natural, not justified all the time, but sort of a normal need for, um, for revenge. I mean, how, you know, the fact that we haven't had one, I don't know what that's evidence of necessarily, but, but if there was another, if once we are out of Afghanistan, something happens that originated there that, and people go, oh, we could have prevented it if we'd been there. I mean, how do you address this question, this thing that has been, I think, a big driver of keeping us there for so long, which is, I don't want to be the person who pulls out and then sees an attack and, you know, all hell breaks loose. And so, so what, what do yeah. you make of that? So the dialectic of the war on terror is that it generates ever more enemies. Those enemies are eventually going to attack the United States. They will eventually attack the United States at home. They've done it. The reasons why they're doing it is because of the grievances they've had because of these wars. Yes, there will be more violence after uh, the war on terror, um, after some hypothetical day, um, hopefully you know one that isn't hypothetical, when the whole thing is abolished, um, there are just forces that the United States can't wish out of existence, having proven no capability at mitigating them, because the United States doesn't do the thing that ultimately makes the, the American people safer, which is to stop trying to dictate the events of foreign societies, stop extracting wealth from foreign populaces and redistributing it toward the elite in this country, the United States doesn't act in an ethic of solidarity with the peoples of the world. 
that more than anything else is the premier security threat faced to the United States, to the American people in particular. Um, American foreign policy is doing that. Um, it will continue to do that unless it is overhauled in such a way that allows for real material um, redistribution of wealth, a respect uh, for people's dignity as well as their sovereignty, and the establishment of mechanisms for real international cooperation with meaningful democratic control. Meaningful democratic control is not something we have either nationally or certainly internationally. And that is the reason why these international institutions are so easily um, discredited and attacked. Um, and you know, good upper middle class liberals wonder why it is that things like the United Nations are not in fact popular let alone popular by the people that the United Nations allegedly seeks to help. The reason is there is no meaningful democratic control. This needs to be an urgent aspect of the 21st century, a century where we are seeing now, both with the pandemic and both the manifested impacts of warming the planet, we're in a circumstance in which we won't solve any of these problems. We won't even mitigate any of these problems unless in a meaningful democratic way, we work together. And that includes making sure that the people who generate the wealth of the world, the people who work for it, ultimately are the ones who enjoy that wealth rather than having it distributed upward in an increasingly, frankly, um, extractive and uh, dangerous way. Well, what do you make of what all this says about human nature and what uh, sort of a traditional liberal would think about um, what human beings need and want? Um, what, what, by that, I mean, are we, are our humanitarian efforts doomed? Is this, a, you know, a situation where we go, look, we tried, we tried to give them democracy. They didn't want it. Maybe not everybody wants democracy. Maybe uh, we should let them make up whatever situation they want to. And let's stop trying to say every human being wants or deserves X. I think that's a question. That's so the, the question from the, um, from the audience member is, um, yeah, what should a what should America what role should America play in promoting human rights globally going forward? Or do you even see a role for America on this front? I think that the way you actually promote human rights is through an ethic of social solidarity that allows for a meaningful democratic expression where people make decisions around their communities and that democratic input scales upward. And the way you promote human rights is I think through a redefinition of what human rights are. There are some really excellent books about this um, by Yale University's Samuel Moyne. Um, one that is about to come out uh, that I can highly recommend um, is uh, his forthcoming book, Humane, uh, which is a study of how the human, probably he wouldn't put it in quite these terms, but the impact of the human rights revolution on becoming essentially a driver of war rather than um, a force to stop war. So one of those things that we have to do is reinvigorate our understanding of the relationship that war plays with repression. Um, a really unfortunate thing um, has taken hold um, really since um, the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, but you know, particularly after 9-11, the idea that the United States is engaged in these wars to spread democracy. It's doing no such thing. It is spreading no democracy anywhere. It is creating structures that inhibit democracy, that erode democracy. The United States isn't and wasn't in Afghanistan because of feminism. It wasn't in, you know, in Afghanistan or Iraq or anywhere else um, to make sure that people were freer and had a real um, say over their lives. It was in Iraq and Afghanistan and everywhere else for its own interests. The structures it built were not for the Afghan people, the Iraqi people and so forth. Those structures it built for itself in order to exercise its power in these places, hopefully by proxy. Um, and it sets up these structures as well so that it materially benefits 
from the wealth of these countries. It's an extractive process. It's not a democratic process. We have to come to terms with that. And then accordingly, we have to, um, once recognizing that, rededicate ourselves. I, I, the last thing I am is an isolationist. I am against American empire. I am for global solidarity that can be expressed through global movements of working people that exercise power, that exercise democratic control, that determine their legitimacy through democratic control, that will redistribute wealth democratically in order to ensure that a basic aspect of human rights, the dignity of owning the fruits of your labor and not having them taken from you is front and center in human rights. If we lived in a world like that, and obviously I don't wanna be Pollyannish about this or, or, or the, the task it will take, it's quite possibly that climate change will ensure that we never get to see this world. If we lived in a world like that, we would be safer. We would have the thing that the United States claims to be delivering through the war on terror, but never will. Can it be done without Marxism or socialism? Um, well, we may disagree about that. I think that ultimately, you know, the, I think personally, I don't think so, but you know, my analysis does not depend on that happening. You asked me um, that question, you know, not as a reporter, uh, but as more of an analyst and, you know, speaking as someone um, who is a socialist um, and a very proud socialist, um, I believe that this tradition points to a way forward of dignity and a way out of barbarism. Uh, we do have time for, I believe, one more question. And this is one, and I, do, I, I hope I'm not leaving it on a down note because uh, the book is quite actually for, for what you're dealing with is quite comprehensive. Um, but, but I do have a question here from the audience. It says, is there a story issue or topic that did not make it into the book um, that you wish you had, or, uh, you know, if you had several volumes, maybe it's the idea for another book, but uh, we did talk a little bit about the media's role in this situation, but uh, what else? Um I wish that I had done uh, a better job. Each of um, the first three chapters, um, which you know, looks from a different perspective at you know different um, kind of castes or classes um, in relationship to the war on terror, the security state, um, the Republican Party, and the conservative movement more broadly, and then the Democratic Party. Um, each of those kind of starts with a little bit of a quick recap of like, remember there was this thing called the Cold War. Um, and here's where everyone kind of left the Cold War, like having experienced um, the Cold War. Um, some of that is triumphal, some of that is mechanistic, some of that uh, is fearful. Um, but what I didn't really do, and I think this is a flaw of the book that I would like to correct, you know, not necessarily in a later edition, but in you know, a different book where I think that um, it might, you know, better fit um, to the actual uh, legacy of the security states version of anti-communism. Because when you study in particular, um, I didn't know this until unfortunately after I had written the book, um, you know, reading uh, people like authors like Greg Grandin and his excellent book, Empire's Workshop, about America in Latin, uh, Central and South America, as well as um, Vincent Bevan's excellent book, uh, The Jakarta Method, which was about how uh, violent anti-communism um, and its admixture uh, with the CIA uh, can take an eliminationist and did take in places like Indonesia um, and Chile and Argentina and El Salvador uh, really quite an eliminationist turn. Um, I, prob I regret that the book didn't do enough of a job connecting the ways in which the CIA acts during the war on terror have very direct material and bureaucratic antecedents, barely a generation removed at the start from things like the dirty wars um, in Latin and South America. Well, maybe 
maybe another book, maybe, maybe your next book now that you're a pro and you've done one <laughs> and you've done one. Uh, so everyone we want to thank Spencer Ackerman and Spencer, if you want to just stay with us here on the feed uh, until you're, you're going to get a cue for a cut. So hang here. Um, he's the author of the new book called Reign of Terror, how the 9-11 era destabilized America and produced Trump. Thanks so much for joining us today, Spencer. We'd like to thank our audience for watching and for participating, sending in those great questions. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org online. I'm Melissa Kane. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy.